Dr. Greg Austin, who's the Institute's Vice President for Worldwide Security in from London. And Greg, um, one of the things that a lot of people have said about Egypt and all the ramification of what's going on is there was no real foreshadowing. Um, that true? Well, I think that's uh, true in one sense. You never know the moment that this thing is going to blow up. But the long-term trends were pretty clear. As way back as 2002, for example, there were, uh, the Arab Debe Development Report, the first Arab Development Report, commissioned by the UNDP, written by Arab intellectuals. It talked about the deficit of development, the deficit of liberty, and the deficit of learning uh, in the region, and said if these three things are not fixed, then the region was on a downward path. Hmm. And I think that's borne out by events. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the big things is this very young population, as everybody knows, and lack of jobs, uh, not enough education. You know, some people, I guess a few countries, uh, tried, to, tried to deal with that. But um, Yeah, that's right. So countries like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, was, they were very conscious of the need to educate the youth, they were very conscious of the need to fight violent extremism with development, uh, with jobs for the young people. Uh, and in the end of the, at the end of the day, they were making some success, making some progress. I think that one's in Turkey as well, right? Yeah, in Turkey as well. And mm -hmm. what's sort of um, what's very obvious in places like uh, Egypt and Tunisia is that that development path didn't uh, reach enough of the people. So Egypt is a country divided, 50% uh, rural, 50% urban, and that rural population was certainly not getting it, nor were the poor urban communities. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And one of the big things that we, we as EWA, as an action, as a think and do tank, trying try to move things, obviously job creation requires certain kinds of things. One of the big ones is, in, is infrastructure, well, create jobs. You need infrastructure. And I think one of the things, when we talk about gloominess that a lot of people in the West have of what's happening, I think there's really some pretty dramatic things. I mean, one can, one can look at this whole belt from the Middle East going all the way across through Asia, uh, and the, the amount of infrastructure going in in terms of roads and, and highways and what oil pipelines, gas pipelines, uh, everything uh, is, is opening up a whole new set of abilities. I remember looking at a, at a map of the United States before 1950 in the internet, interstate highway system in places like Detroit were up in the middle of nowhere doing nothing. It wasn't a big, you know, so you have this huge connectivity uh, that, that this allows. And so is, and then this is kind of step one of what's happening. What, what else has to happen? Yeah, well, I think you're right, John. And some countries of the region have singled out this infrastructure problem and quite a few Western and companies are involved. What else has to happen um, is one area that I know you're interested in, and that's water development in the region. Mm -hmm. So we know, for example, that the world population is going to um, increase by 50% in the next 30 to 40 years, but the available water resources will remain the same. So we've got to start using water very differently. We've got to put a new price on water. But what's very interesting about the countries of this region is that they're seized with this issue. They're organising themselves. And um, even intergovernmental organizations like the Organization of Islamic Conference are starting to sort of try and find solutions for that. UNDP is active in the region. A new regional economic organization, well, it's not so new, but becoming better organized and higher profile, the Economic Cooperation Organization, which brings together Turkey, Pakistan, Iran, and several other countries, mm -hmm. uh, they're really active in this area. It's interesting, even the, the BRICS, the BRIC, BRIC countries, uh, have actually started a very innovative program on looking at the co correlation of climate change and food production, and are actually in some ways moving much further ahead than, than, some, than some of the so-called uh, uh, you know, developed countries. Yeah. So, so, there, so there, is, there is a lot happening. I think that's one of the, one, one of the positive things in, in uh, where all this is going. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think the final message I, I think I would make about all of this is that the liveliness, the spirit, and the passion for change that we see in this part of the world is not matched by Europe or the United States in a sense where there's a more complacent attitude, a sort of a sense that everything is going to go along quite okay. But I think the thing to watch will be the next sort of two to five years just to see how the global economy unfolds in the face of these developments in a very sensitive, energy-rich area. Well, you, you, apart from running our cybersecurity initiative, uh, which which is also somewhat related to the, to the number of these things, uh, you're developing this whole work in economic security. And so, so in your point of view, does this nexus of water, infrastructure, um, energy, is, it, is this sort of the, the central part of what we have to do to look at getting at that question of, of jobs and, and the stability in, in the, what is now a highly volatile region? Well, I think it's definitely a part of it. The uh, <coughs> The Arab Development Reports have singled out the need for education, they've singled out the need for developing the transportation infrastructure, and I think that without this, uh, um, that development that we need to ease the political strains and tensions is not going to occur. So economic security in this region is definitely a part of the East-West Institute's agenda for the next five years.